button. <clears throat> well, good evening, everyone. We are still doing Therapy of Desire, Martha Nussbaum's tome, and we're at Chapter 9, The Stoic Tonics. It was, uh, that was a fairly long chapter, wasn't it? Um, I'm glad I jumped into it a little bit early, but sometimes the problem with reading it a bit early is that half a week passes and you can't really remember what you've read because it's so long. So lucky I've got my notes, but they're not the best notes in the world. Um, I think I was just sort of transcribing interesting things from the text. If I had, if I had, uh, I was going to say if I had more time, that just sounds like a pop out, but if I was a bit more organized, I would have written some, um, and better questions so as we go along if anything comes up that you really want to talk about then definitely just jump straight in um uh i've got about a page on chapter one so do you, do you want to say something about what you said, thought about it first or wh whether you've read it in the first place um i yeah. i really like anything to do with the stoics of course and and nussbaum's great to read i heard people saying that uh, her style was a bit different, her interpretation's a bit different. Um, but I, I just think it's it's quite interesting, maybe because it comes more from that um, classics angle. You get a bit more of the context. Um, I think that's quite interesting, some of those, um, the minutiae of the debates and, and stuff like that. So what did you guys think? Yeah, I, I thought it was a, a great chapter. So good to be into the stoic part. I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I find the first two sections were mainly introductory and she was sort of getting into her pace and getting into her style. So, so um, and then she really hits the meat of it in in, chap in sections three and four and from there. Um, so, and her scholarship is just wonderful and uh, it, it, you know, she's just remarkable, really. And the, just the theme of using the kitty and has she's been consistent with that as well. So, mm. yeah, I really enjoyed the chapter, but I'm somewhat in the situation you alluded to, Courtney, because I read it early in the fortnight. <laughs> and now I'm looking back at the text thinking, ah, oh, <laughs> what did I think about this? So, yeah, let's hope I can collect my. Um, or recollect what I what I noted uh, in reading. Dan or Ashley? Yeah, uh, yeah I smashed it out in a few days, and um, I, I thought it was yeah, it was really good. She really like did uh, kind of go to show that um, stoicism was the most kind of well rounded uh, and like complex of all the. Um, you know, as far as the medical model of therapy with using philosophy, that it was like it really actually was the most kind of suitable. Uh, and the way it sort of went into detail about, you know, how to like if you wanted to kind of reconstruct a um, stoic kind of therapeutic relationship with someone, as you went into lots of detail from Seneca about how, you know, you have to be both teacher and the student and that you have to learn from the text as well as actually converse deeply with them yourself and yeah, yeah. so um you know if you, if you want to bring stoicism back back alive as it was i think yeah it'd be a really good chapter to get really familiar with i have not read the chapter uh, or the book for that matter so i'm interested to hear where the discussions go Uh, just uh, the good old chapter summary that I found someone to put together. Got a few dot points and probably like most things um, that you learn when you're doing philosophy is sometimes you um, you end up, it, it, it kind of primes you to start thinking in a certain way and then you actually go off on tangents um, that become more useful than the actual content that you're actually kind of reading, if that makes sense. So it's one of those kinds of experiences of, um, yeah, thinking a little bit beyond some of those those concepts and, you know, things, questions such as, you know, what is a good person and 
am I a good person? And how does one define that emotionally and logically in those kinds of questions? Thanks. Great. I must admit, um, <clears throat> rereading this, I can see what an impact it made on me because um, I've been really interested in trying to think about what a stoic therapy would look like um, for the last couple of years. And it must be, have definitely, um, if you know, in my unconscious or subconscious, because rereading it, I was thinking, oh, yeah, I'm sort of. Yeah, that's kind of what it, where I'm aiming for. That's that's really cool. So, yeah, I, I very much agree with the approach that she kind of outlines. Um, yeah, but anyway, so chapter one then. Um, again, like I said, um, <clears throat> I've really got just some chunks here, so I'll, I'll I'll just read out what I've got, and maybe we can use them as discussion pieces. So in the first bit, I, I really like that um, Cicero's um, quote here. There is, I assure you, a medical art for the soul. It is philosophy whose aid need not be sought as in bodily diseases from outside ourselves. We must endeavour with all our resources and all our strength to become capable of doctoring ourselves. I just think that's such a, a, a wonderful quote. Um, so the topic becomes, um, what are these philosophical treatments and what forms of human sicknesses do they claim to heal? And the Stoics share with the Epicureans and the Skeptics a deep interest in human self-sufficiency and tranquility. <clears throat> and as shown in the above quote, the Stoics have a high respect for each person's active practical reasoning. The patient must not simply remain a patient, dependent and receptive, as, as in Epicureanism, as um, Ashley was saying before, they must become their own doctor. So the therapy is very intriguing because rather than there being some expert who, who solely administers a cure, the person learns along the way to become their own doctor. I just think that's a really appropriate way of doing therapy. The Stoics combine this respect for reason with a commitment to the radical criticism of conventional belief and to the inclusion within philosophy all of all of rational humanity. This gives rise, rise to a distinctive curriculum, one based on the ideas of rational self-government and universal citizenship. Just on that point too, I, that in the last few months especially has really become quite interesting to me, that idea of Stoicism as a criticism of conventional belief, um, a critique of common opinion. And the more you think about it, the more it's such it's such at the heart of it, even perception, you know, like obviously all these Hellenistic schools have have a critique of the ordinary view of perception, more or less. It's sort of up for grabs, you know, can we rely on the senses or or do we have to kind of perform some sort of critique? And I think the Stoics really, they really do a very, um, they do something very interesting with, with that sort of critique. And, and they really politicize it. They get us to question our beliefs and our political institutions and the nature of virtue and, and what that would look like in society. Do you guys have anything to say about that, particularly that around that common opinion, critique of the common opinion? It's good. That's good. Okay. The stoic condemnation of the passions presupposed the self-sufficiency of true good and the worthlessness of externals. Okay, that's such a hot topic, the treatment of the passions, and that will come up again later. Obviously, there's this cognitive model here that, uh, that the passions are really just forms of belief. They're just beliefs that have very strong valid content attached to them, and especially about the worth of external things. So as opposed to other schools that the ordinary person's external attachments, <clears throat> um, sorry, as opposed to other schools, uh, the ordinary person's external attachments commit the agent to emotional conditions that by their very nature can be neither moderated 
nor adjusted to the requirements of reason. Indeed, they cannot be stopped from taking the agent straight into an excess, a cruelty, and a monstrous a monstrousness that most ordinarily that most ordinary people themselves condemn and flee. I mean, just in that language, we're reminded of that. It's sent is no, it's the 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 metaphor by Chrysippus. It's Chrysippus, isn't it, of the man running down the hill? The idea that um, that's what anger or passion is a lot like. Um, you might draw a line in the sand at the end of the hill, sort of so stating that's where I reasonably or rationally would would like to stop, but unfortunately, the momentum of the passion carries you past the point that's that's reasonable. So we lose control of ourselves. The Stoics also developed a political theory that both supports and is supported by their general account of philosophical therapy. They set themselves the task of producing a just and humane society, and they argue that this task, like individual therapy, is achieved through philosophical therapy. The diagnosis of the diseases of passion becomes the basis for a diagnosis of political disorder and the extirpation of passion is said to promise a new basis for political virtue. So at the heart of this um, Stoic therapy, there's some really interesting things going on. Um, there's some core themes that I think are really worth thinking about. They're, they're like these structural principles, if you like, that make the therapy work and also make them basically a critique of the common opinion. So on the one hand, there's this view that we're all parts of a much larger whole, larger whole, so um, um, and and that we're designed to work together to cooperate with one another, and that that's quite a radical critique already of of the common opinion, which you know, as we know, kind of tends to emphasise competition and uh, hanging on to resources, not not missing out personally, kind of the development of the individual ego against the whole, that kind of stuff. Um, and it's it's a critique of that. And also, of course, there's this idea of even though we are part of a whole, we still, almost sort of paradoxically, but not, are a rational unity. So we're like we're we're a rational integrity. That's a better way of putting it. So we contain within ourselves um, kind of a rational wholeness, and and whatever belongs to that already is what we are kind of required to look after and to strengthen and to cultivate. Um, that becomes a core feature to therapy because anything outside of that gets called external and um, kind of the stuff that people hang on to and get distracted by but tends to diminish their ability to enjoy their lives or to to use what's been given to them wisely and and in the background there, there's this sort of innate understanding of human flourishing, that if you make use of the of this rational integrity that you've been given, if you make use of it according to nature and appropriately, you will flourish. You'll be healthy, you'll be happy, you'll be an excellent specimen. And I think the, the third part tends to be, and I've been thinking about this more and more, and she doesn't say this, but I've been thinking, <clears throat> maybe because I've been reading a bit more Marcus Aurelius, that the theme of change and temporality is also very strong. Um, it's not so obviously stated. It is in, in Marcus Aurelius, but um, in the others, maybe not so much. But it's definitely this idea that the world's always changing and there's nothing you can do to stop that and that you occupy only a brief moment in time. And so there's this idea of just acceptance and letting go and, and being able to accept the lot you're given, your limited influence, and so on, and uh, and taking on your duties regardless of of the otherwise insignificance of it all in, in a way. Um, so that's my little summary of part one. Does anyone want to say anything about any of those parts? Um, I, I was just going to mention that um, I, I was interested to, on her comment at the end of it, just saying that she sees Seneca and Epictetus as in support of Chrysippus, Chrysippus, um, Chrysippus's orthodoxy on the analysis of the passions, because it interests me, you know, the continuity in the school and who who followed who, and in and uh, it was just that she made that comment, you know, that Seneca, both Seneca and Epictetus seem to support 
the, the Chrysippan orthodoxy. Do you know what they're kind of referring to there? Because I'm pretty sure I have a rough idea. The anal well, the analysis, the, the way they talk about them, the way they anal analyze emotion and the way their, their theory on emotion, isn't it? Particularly to do with the tripartite soul because Posidonius came onto the picture, according to Galen. And again, this is a, Nussbaum is writing in 96 or something. Um, since then, there's been a lot of argument about this particular issue because some people are saying that, well, Galen's report, Galen's report of Posidonius's view of the soul looks more like Plato. It's this tripartite conception of the soul, which tends to break with the normal Stoic conception of, of the soul as a unity. And nowadays, people are starting to argue, I think people like Christopher Gill, I can't remember exactly, but they're sort of saying, well, maybe Galen's just sort of stretching it a little bit here to fit with his more medical model. Um, it, it's not as there's a bit of a debate is what I'm saying about whether whether Posidonius actually did see it that way or not. Do you have an opinion on that, Judith? Uh, look, I I haven't read the relevant passages in Galen, so but yeah, there there is a bit of a debate, but in a sense, it's one of those things where I I mean it, I think we've mentioned before there's this pursuit of orthodoxy right there's this pursuit of the um the original the authentic the archetypal you know so in, in the case of stoicism that comes back to well how closely did they follow Chrysippus or Zeno Chrysippus Cleanthes you know and in a sense to me a, a lot of that debate misses the point or misses some of the point which is that it was a dynamic system you know and and the in broad terms I would say that you can it's quite obvious that the Roman Stoics, uh, in broad terms, adhered to the positions of the early Stoa, because but but also they they did diverge in in some ways and also took inspiration from other sources such as um, the Epicureans. So, in a sense, there the pursuit of the pursuit of authenticity, particularly and particularly this is the case particularly with Posidonius and Panidius, where we have nothing. <laughs> Or in fact, there's a couple of fragments, I think, you know, here or there. Well, it's like, well, essentially of their voluminous works, we have nothing. So, you know, it's diminishing returns in trying to assess um, some of these matters. And particularly from, from people like Galen, who, and it's just, it's not a criticism of Galen. It's just a statement to say that someone like Galen or uh, another source that's cited is Clement of Alexandria in the second century AD, who was a Christian polemicist. So obviously he's got a different agenda, you know, just as Galen had a different agenda. So a lot of these sources um, have to be treated with a great deal of caution. Uh, and yes, they can um, illum they can shed a bit of light on some of what otherwise is totally missing to us. But we also have to, to treat their takes, as I say, with a certain amount of, um, yeah, with a big grain of salt. And, and I think the issue around uh, the, the platonic, um, corpus and the platonic system. I think, well, you were there, Jody, and, and Ashley as well, with when we discussed Letter 58, you know, St Seneca uh, is very careful to set out a kind of a stoic worldview, and then he, he stepped aside, took one step back and, and set out a platonic worldview. And he, he didn't, and he wasn't doing it in a polemical way, he was just setting it out as, as a, a framework for discussion, essentially. So and I think that's a fruitful way to look at it rather than trying to um, track down or pin down inconsistencies or divergences or heresies, essentially, <laughs> which I think a lot of a lot of this uh, tends to become. I would like to say that there's one feature of it that I think is very relevant for our discussion of a therapy, and that is, and this is the, the criticism that tends to come up, is that if we have a tripartite type soul, that means that emotion is or desire the appetitive part of the soul if you like is separate from the rational part of the soul in some way and that means that the stoic therapy um, the philosophical approach that they use may not be able to penetrate the part of the soul where emotion lives because in some way it's discrete from and that that causes problems for the for the philosophy as a therapy not as a philosophy 
And I think that's why it comes up here and in Margaret Graver's book in particular, in particular, because the Stoics really do want to go after the passions and show that they're just another form of reason, that they don't, they're not squirreled off in some separate part of the soul. That in fact they're just exactly the same thing as reason, just reason poorly used. To me, that's interesting. But also there's that idea that with Galen, you know, he's much later, obviously, than the early Stoics, and he's a doctor, and he's noticing, well, he's trying to develop a physical science of medicine, and, and he's thinking that parts of the soul can be, like, located within the organs of the body. So in a way, he is doing a sort of, like, well, this part is responsible for for the emotions, you know, is is the mind in the brain or is it in the heart, you know, and all that sort of stuff. So there's different technologies, of course, going on at the same time. Um, who would like to do part two? Um, oh, look, I'll jump in and, and belt through part two so we, that we can get into part three and four, if you like, just so. Um, okay. Um, all right. So we're up to page 320. We're starting at the top of um, part two. So... Um, Nussbaum tells us Nikidian is still uh, confused and vulnerable. She's just come out of all these other schools, you know. She's done this big uh, march through these various schools, and she's look and she's looking for understanding and autonomy and to be a member of a community. She wants to reason. She's disinterested with uh, she's has disinterested thought, uh, but and but wishes to have sustained effort. So she's aiming for active practical reasoning and she wants to be healthier, stronger and thinking for herself. That's how it's summed up. So she wants philosophy to be part of her health and not just an agent for cure. Um, so the Stoics claim that many deeply held ordinary beliefs, this is on page 322 now, the Stoics claim that many deeply held ordinary beliefs will not pass test for rationality. Uh, as you said before, Courtney. So, for example, she uses the uh, the one about that women should not do philosophy because at the on, in the day women were discouraged. So, Nikidian preserved is preserved uh, is presented. She's presented here as a student of the Roman school, um, but, but the Greeks also insisted that an ideal city would have equal citizenship for all. Um, uh, for all virtuous human beings, right? So that's that was the view of the 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 polis, um, even with no gender difference in clothing, because that was uh, something that Zeno had put forward right back in the beginning. So this idea of equality is very pushed hard here. Um, Musonius Rufus talked about women having, uh, in his argument, he had a like a just a dialogue or the. He had a discussion with a fellow um, and said that they were talk, uh, arguing about whether women should do philosophy. Women have five senses, reasoning powers, sensitivity to ethical distinctions, desire, and a natural orientation to oikiosis or, you know, uh, um, uh, wishing to, to survive um, in a healthy way. Um, the philosophical mind is genderless. And we're on page 323, by the way. The philosophical mind is genderless. Also, virtues are the norm for males and females, and philosophy will promote those virtues. Women also need practical wisdom to run a household. She needs moderation, justice, and courage. Who will know not to be servile to tyrants, selling her family out in fear of her life, says Nussbaum. So, like, uh, or Musonius. Musonius was arguing, you know, you need you need a good strong wife, you need a wise wife, you know. Finally, women nor men should be sitting around because so one of the arguments his uh, uh, interlocutor put forward was that, um, oh well, you know, she'll get lazy and not do her jobs, and she'll just want to sit around and argue with the men all day. And he said, well, hang on, um, that you know. Um, he said, well, women nor men should be sitting around arguing all day. Uh, there must be evidence in um, practical action and deeds, right? So um, he has shown no difference in female faculties in education and deals with um, the problem of leisure. So he's covered all the gamuts of, of um, quite well as to why women should be able to 
practice philosophy. So deep respect is shown. It should be noted to the interlocutor who, so that was part of it all too, that, you know, in this idea of therapy, that the interlocutor, that the student uh, is shown very deep respect and uh, their views are uh, considered and brought out um, very deeply. And the radical conclusion being the only reasonable and consistent one to be found by the sincere interlocutor, meaning that, you know, yeah, he ended up agreeing with Musonius. And that brings us to page 325. Can we start you, go, you go, Judith. Do okay. you want to say something about that? Um, no, I think that's uh, that's a good summary. I would just add, though, and that no mention of Masonius should go by without our remembering that he went into exile, I think, twice, um, you know, because he wouldn't stand for whatever nonsense the empress uh, were coming up with. You know, he really stuck by his beliefs. He, he was a, a very principled man. And so I think that accords his, his uh, words, as recorded here, um, additional authority. You know, he he uh, he put his own life and livelihood on the line for what he believed. And and also just quickly, I just want to notice or make a point of that that whole idea that the Stoics kind of uh, focusing on the universality of reason and how even you know what kind of what a what a great kind of penetrating philosophy it really is because they. They can see beyond, you know, class and gender and stuff like that when they when they apply this kind of method to that everyone ought to be treated equal with the same sort of rational dignity because we all share that sort of capacity in common. I think that's such a a beautiful way of looking at it. And apparently, it's it has lasting effect on history, doesn't it? Like this view had a very important kind of effect on is it the American Constitution? Not sure. Yeah, I mean, every, um, well, particularly in the 18th century, yeah, this, these ideas were literally revolutionary, that, that class didn't matter, gender didn't matter, it, what mattered was, was virtuous life, yeah, I mean, it's still revolutionary, really, when you think about it. <laughs> All right, well, I'll plunge in at section three, then. So, uh, Nussbaum uh, gives some quotes from uh, uh, Epictetus around uh, reasoning being what distinguishes us from the animals uh, and it's the foundation of humanity uh, and uh, then this uh, and I really like the way she in this chapter that she deploys Seneca's letters to Lasalius. I think she gives a very good account of them um, in le letter 41 um, uh, and uh, Seneca brings up this idea, well, why should people take credit for things that are absolutely irrelevant to themselves, such as, you know, they've got a large house, big estate, lots of servants. Uh, th that's not pertinent to themselves. That's just external. What is central to the person is the soul and reason fulfilled in the soul. And, uh, that's, and that's because the human is a reasoning animal. And that's just what it means to be a human. Uh, reason is not just the most important thing about humans, it is also something that is fully their own in their power to cultivate and control. And again, that's pretty revolutionary. It's pretty powerful uh, from a therapeutic perspective. Uh, so then uh, Nussbaum gives us another quote from letter 41 about what, uh, what we can expect from uh, the practice of prayer. Uh, it's not about begging gods, begging the gods for a particular outcome. Rather, the God is inside you. And again, this is pretty revolutionary too. Um, Messiah a Holy Spirit is seated within us, a watcher and a guardian of our good and bad actions. And as this spirit is treated by us, so it treats us. So that's also pretty radical. It's a radical um, equivalence, really, of the divine and the human interacting uh, and so yeah this is this is uh, the radical view that there's a piece of divinity that in, um, informs the entire universe but it also informs us do you I've think that idea of, go on sorry no, no you go oh, i was oh, just going to say do you think that idea of the holy spirit was carried across to christianity is that where 
came from, do you think? Um, well, there's certainly, certain scholars have certainly argued that, Jodie. Uh, mm -hmm. um, the name always escapes me. It's an, a Norwegian scholar who's written a whole book, I think, about the idea that the early Christian theorists simply took, a, took across the Stoic pneuma and translated it as the Holy Spirit. And I think there's certainly a, certainly um, a strong argument to be made for that. And there was certainly, um, I, I would say, motivation to do that because that was something that educated um, people in the Roman Empire would have understood. It's like, oh, yeah, yeah, we know about pneuma because we know about Stoicism. So it's like, okay, it, it made it uh, made it intelligible, I guess, because, because it was already part of the worldview. Yeah, I was going to mention too, because I, I really like this topic. I'm really intrigued by the, the daemon. And um, and we find it in Plato, of course, earlier. You got that idea that, and it's much older. You get that feeling just reading that it's obviously a, a very, very old belief that when you're born, you're given a guardian spirit that looks over you. And, it, and it, sometimes it's a god even. It's a lesser god. And uh, and yeah and it guides you and instructs you throughout the course of your life and it's really a matter of trying to work out how to listen to it um through these practices i think that's that's really fascinating and and i mean as we move away from a mythological model to a more psychological conception of the human being we have to ask really like, i think it's a really interesting psychological thing like why is it that a human being needs a bridge between the world of, of man and the divine? Like, why not just do away with it? But we see it in St. Augustine, too. He talks about the Holy Spirit as, as the bridge, the, the connection between man and, and God. And in the same way, we, we see that in the Stoics, um, that man can't be just this thing on its own with providence out there there needs to be a method by which we can communicate somehow between ourselves between the two states this kind of radical temporality that the human being is in versus this this kind of i don't know whatever you want to call it this this perfection and there needs to be a way in which we can relate to one another i just think that's to me that's really interesting i could think about that forever didn't we? Okay, so, so Nicodian is going to be taught that reason is fundamentally connected with practical choice and avoidance. So those are things we know from Epictetus. Um, uh, Epictetus imagines the gods saying, we, that's the, the divine, we have given you a certain portion of ourself, this power of pursuit and avoidance, of desire and aversion. And to put it simply, the power to use appearances, that's fantasia in Greek. And so uh, Nikidian is accorded in, in, in this way a great deal of freedom, maybe a kind of scary amount of freedom. So then we get to the most uh, general strategy of Stoic therapy, that the pupil must be watchful and critical of the way in which he sees the world. In her control is, quote, the most powerful and dominating thing of all, the correct use of appearances, unquote. So that's right in the first section of Epictetus' discourse, Discourses. Uh, and, of course, this is fundamental um, because the external world, well, when I say external, that world in which we interact, impinges itself through our sense perceptions and it's incumbent on us to subject those impressions to uh, searching assessment prior to according assent because so many of the judgments that um and this comes back to the the, the point about social beliefs you know so many of the judgments that society seems to take for granted are erroneous and, and but we can only establish that by subjecting them to proper assessment uh, so epictetus writes that when someone assents to something false he wasn't he, he didn't want to do that, but it seemed to him that what was in fact false was true. Because fundamental to the Stoic worldview, as of course to Socrates, is that nobody does wrong on purpose. Nobody intentionally does wrong. They do what seems good to them. And so that means that there's a whole lot of 
mistaken impressions and, and erroneous assent going on out there. And it's incumbent on us uh, to avoid that as far as we can. Now that brings us not only to sense perception, but to terrible moral judgments such as Medea. What's happened with Medea? So yeah, as Ashley said in the chat, the soul is deprived of truth against its will. That's a lo lovely way of expressing it. What's happened with Medea? Medea has, um, has assented to uh, assented to an impression that's been part of her um, jealous passion, her jealousy of what Jason, what she thinks Jason is planning, which is to um, start a relationship with another woman. That's uh, the princess of the city that they're staying in. And so her jealousy leads her to wrong judgments, a terribly wrong judgment. So um, Epictetus, however, is he can be generous to Medea, and it's for this reason that she is mistaken in this most fundamental way. Why then are you angry with her? Because the poor woman has gone astray concerning the most important things and has turned from a human being into a poisonous snake. Why do you not, if anything, feel sorry for her the way we feel sorry for the blind and the lame? Why don't we feel the same compassion for those who are blinded and lame in the most crucial respects? So this was really important kind of, again, this is where Stoicism is very countercultural counter and counter as it would have been intuitive because Medea was kind of a cultural villain essentially in, in the Greco-Roman world because of what she, what she did, which was to kill her children uh, because she, was, she felt betrayed and jealous of her husband, Jason. Um, and, you know, this is <laughs> the whole Medea thing is so relevant to our society. So how often do we see cases where somebody in, in the passion of jealousy or simply, um, simply to take revenge on their former partner or their current partner or who, who performs some terrible act of violence? Unfortunately, it seems to be a, a constant or, a, or something that regularly occurs. And, and that's why it's such a powerful archetype because it, it does horrify us that people can be so, can, people can make such bad judgments that they would do that. So that's why the, the, the example of Medea is so important. And it must have been, you know, the, the Roman Stoics must have felt it was such an important case study, essentially, of wrong judgment and where it can lead and through the vehicle of passion. So uh, Epictetus goes on that to, and the Kidians being asked to get into the habit of saying to every harsh appearance, you are an appearance and not the only way of seeing the thing that appears. Then examine it and test it by the yardsticks you have. So by the, by the, um, the, the rules or the criteria that you have, you, you try to make the best judgment you can. Uh, and Nussbaum points out she's likely to be in the group of habits and conventions so this is a this is a complex and um, time-consuming job and so this is the job of philosophical teaching to assist the student to do this for themselves and so she finishes the section with a quote from Chrysippus and again we return to the literally to the medical model just as it is appropriate for the physician of the body to be inside, as they say, um, the affections, put on, that before the body and the therapeutic treatment that's the proper to each, so it is the task of the physician of the soul to be inside both of these in the best possible way. Uh, and so in the course, she says, of this internal examination, the soul is not inert, object rather than subject. By examining itself along with the doctor, it also shapes and constructs itself. And that's from Seneca letter 16. What, a, what an amazing quote. Um, Seneca absolutely saying that the, the, per, the person has agency in transforming themselves. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, it is. It wonderful. seems like starting from within and going out, which does kind of differ to the, the common understanding that it's like 
take something or do something like go from the outside in, you know, in a medical context. And you, I think you get a feeling for a collaborative method too, because the, the doctor can work alongside with the client and uh, kind of get, find out what's going on for them, you know, like a kind of talk therapy, if you like, and, and then help them work through the kind of beliefs that are causing them distress or, or not distress, but the beliefs that are causing them, you know, problems with their use of reason, for example, um, and and then at some point that person knows knows the game and uh, are, are learning how to do exactly that same procedure within themselves. Does that make sense? Oh, do you agree? I mean, or not? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, and just on that view of Medea too, I remember Epictetus making that comment too that. The great tragedy is that, and I guess this is relevant to a therapy, is that uh, Medea believes that she's been harmed in some way. And that's really important for the Stoic therapy to work because Medea believes that she's been, um, that a great injustice has been done to her. She's been wronged and she's been harmed in some very profound way. And that gives um, justification to to the kind of violence that she dishes out on her children and 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 as a revenge to Jason because it's a kind of moral violence it's it's that kind of you've harmed me in such a deep way therefore I'm 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 warranted that this is appropriate action I, I ought to act in this manner it becomes good to act in this manner and of course the stoic therapist is going to say well, the belief that you can be harmed by any external thing is what causes you to get into this sorry state. So this is what we need to cure, not just Medea of, but everybody, that they can be harmed by other people and things around them. Because in fact, their, their argument is a really radical critique of common, common thinking. They're going to say, no, you can't be harmed if you look after your own reason. If you're the one managing your own reason and, and in charge of your rational integrity, and that's the scope of of where you place your agency, well, then no, you can't be harmed. Yeah, related to that, and something we spoke about like five minutes ago that kind of surprised me. I, I didn't realize in the Stoic understanding, um, like no one could really act immorally. It was just like taking actions based on incorrect judgments. And that's like really radical as well, because with the example of if you find out that someone went on a murdering rampage or something, people are very quick to kind of condemn them. But it's it's very radical to say, well, I feel sorry for them because their judgments were way out. I, I don't think I could do that, but it's a really interesting kind of perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And and that's exactly what's being said about Medea, because she in, in the Greek legend, she killed her her children, her two children, because she was getting back at her former partner, Jason. <laughs> I was like, oh, was, you know, we, mm -hmm. as I say, we see that. But from Epictetus is saying, it's because she made these wrong judgments and because, um, and, and that's why we should pity her rather than condemn her. So, yeah, it's, in, it's really radical. Um, and... I don't think the Stoics would go so far as to say that those actions shouldn't be punished. I think we see in other texts, not so much Epictetus, but um, I'm trying to think. But, yeah, I'm sure there's other texts where the Stoics would quite go along with kind of formal punishments for violent actions. But but from a kind of a, as Courtney says, a therapeutic point of view and a kind of a rational point of view, we look at them and they, and we say, well, they just... They just had really wrong judgments about what was going on and and they allowed them. And so that's one step. And the next step is that they allowed themselves to be over or they allowed their reason to be overcome by the passion of jealousy, anger uh, and, and hurt. Uh, and that's what caused them to do these terrible things. So, yeah, it's, it's a really it is a really radical approach to wrongdoing. Um, but, yeah, it, ultimately it comes comes from the Socratic, from Socrates' own perspective. 
Yeah, and Socrates' perspective on on punishment, if you it was in the Gorgias or somewhere, he says, I think it was the Gorgias, that it's right to pay back what one owes. So that was part of the um what was necessary for the um the healing of the person who was the wrongdoer, that they were required to pay back to do panics of some sort. So, you know, if we can see this sort of Socratic kind of approach to ignorance i imagine that the, the the stoics would probably be quite sympathetic to that idea that it's right to pay back one's owed and it fits with justice anyway right yeah that's right in fact um in in the gorgias i think it's in the gorgias socrates basically says that the wrongdoer who isn't punished is worse off than the wrongdoer who is punished because the wrongdoer mm -hmm. who isn't punished doesn't get the opportunity to to make restitution and to be improved himself or herself in that way. So, yeah, it's it's the right thing for the wrongdoer to undergo punishment because that will be better for them. So, yeah, that's, I guess, the corollary of all this. Yeah, it's part of the medicine of their soul. Um, you guys carry on without me for a second. My kids are fighting. I've just got to interrupt them. All right. Well, I'm happy to go on with section four unless someone else wants to. Or... Well, I, we, I'll do whatever you like whenever you want to break, Judy. Okay. All right. Well, I'll, I'll carry on for a minute then. Yep. So now we're in a position to have a look at what the medical education involves. And here is where Nussbaum goes through her 10 steps uh, that she uh, brings to bear on all the different Hellenistic systems. So first of all, there's the practical goal. So the practical aim of all this is to transform the self, to make the self better every single day. And she gives a number of quotes from Seneca's letters on that uh, theme. Uh, and Epictetus presents the same picture. So uh, interestingly, and this is, on page 330, uh, for the Stoics, the literary and rhetorical dimensions are not merely frills. Uh, they're part and parcel of the process and, and they're part of the rational debate, I guess, around these issues. Um, and Seneca is always, as we know from his letters, reinforcing that he is undertaking this practical outcome of an improvement of the person so both both himself in writing to Lasilius whatever whatever advice he gives to Lasilius he's also giving to himself that he he's at pains to stress that all the time so he's transforming himself even as he is trying to help Lasilius transform himself uh, so and then uh, we have the quote from Arian talking about Epictetus uh, saying that the great teacher was clearly aiming at nothing else but to move the minds of the hearers on towards what is best. So Epictetus' goal is, again, the improvement, uh, the transformation of his students. Uh, so uh, philosophers shouldn't slip into their self-satisfied professional jargon. And, again, this is something Seneca is very clear about, uh, no one can live happily or even tolerably without the study of wisdom. So that's Seneca letter 16. And so this means that it's an urgent matter that everyone should be given the opportunity to study philosophy. Uh, if the audience for philosophy is the entire human race, not just a narrow elite, philosophical teaching and writing will have to develop many shapes and forms in order to reach everyone it ought to reach. That's a really important point, I think, that Nussbaum's making here, and she's kind of glossing on that, the ancient writers in doing so. But um, when we think about it, that's exactly key to, well, it's key to, for instance, what we're doing. You know, one way of um, studying philosophy is to do it in a group, reading a text and talking about it. There are all these different ways in which the, the therapy can take place and needs to take place to, to reach more people. Um, Seneca's works, of course, can be read on a number of different levels. Levels, um, <laughs> She says, <laughs> God, God love her. <laughs> Their choice of Latin in principle opens them up to a relatively broad audience. <laughs> okay. 
Um, what I guess what she's getting at there is that Seneca's Latin is very, um, it's very clear. You know, if, if you understand Latin, Seneca, like Cicero and like Caesar, is is readily ready to readily readily understood. Okay, you just need to know Latin first. Um, so Masonius and Epictetus, of course, wrote in Greek rather than in Latin. Uh, so the second section of her um, analysis is about value relativity. And so this is around uh, the ways in which Stoics try to convince others that the passion should be completely extirpated from human life. I think she's going to address this in more depth in the following chapter. Because, it, of course, the whole the idea that the passions need to be not just moderated but completely extirpated, i.e. rooted out, is, a, again, it's an incredibly radical notion and it's going to require quite a lot of justification. Uh, so... Just quickly there, too. I think part of that point that she, she makes, which I think is a really insightful point, because the value relativity component was that um, that the the patient receiving the med medicine the medic in the medical analogy um, would find their life improved that the the medical work would improve or enrich their life in some way, and the point she's making is even if the the person didn't accept the kind of dogmatic beliefs of the Stoic, you know, regarding the nature of the cosmos and things like that. They would agree in principle with this analysis of of, uh, of belief and how it leads us to having these um, really dangerous passions that disrupt our lives. That's kind of the point she she makes there, which which is really interesting. It's it's almost like they're onto something scientifically, you know, so to speak. Yeah. So um, halfway down page, what page am I on? Uh, 332, um, the idea is that uh, the, the arguments are going to attempt to show people, and this is what you're gesturing to, Courtney, that if they reflect thoroughly enough, they will find some inconsistency in their position and that more superficial beliefs about the objects of the passions are in conflict with deeper and more essential beliefs or commitments around reason. Uh, and there's a beautiful passage she quotes from Epictetus, around um, innate conceptions. Uh, do we have a, a, an innate conception for what is really good? Epictetus writes, we come into the world without any innate conception of a right triangle or a half tone interval. But from some sort of specialized instruction, we learn each of these things. But as for good and bad and fine and shameful and fitting and unfitting and the flourishing life, eudaimonia, and what is proper and incumbent on us and what one must do and what, what not, who was not born with an, with an innate conception of these things. Now, sorry, sidebar here. People go around saying that the Stoics were blank slaters. It's like, no. no. <laughs> Look at this passage. Epictetus is, is saying we have um, innate conceptions of uh, sort of basic moral principles which is again pretty radical uh, he's he's suggesting that we that that we ha we are born with an idea of what is is good and what is bad so uh, without de delving into that particular point um, it's really interesting that the stoics have that that sense of a basic moral framework being absolutely innate to humans. Uh, and then there's the obligation on us as we grow and develop to, to refine what is in us by nature. But nature provides that sound basis from which to start. And as she says, <laughs> under, with understatement, this is a complex topic. Uh, and she's going to return to the origins of error in later chapters. Uh, and she won't attempt to um, examine all the relevant texts because that's another whole book's worth. Uh, so uh, the, the sort of the standard Stoic view, which we can learn from Cicero and Seneca, is children gradually acquire a sense of what is appropriate 
uh, as they mature and that it culminates in the mature adult's grasp of moral order. Each period of life, as Seneca says, has its own constitution, one for the baby, another for the boy, another for the old man. They are all related appropriately to that constitution in which they exist. And so depending on how, how old Nikidian is and, and how mature she is, uh, the teacher will be able to adjust uh, to her the state of her moral intuitions. Uh, so she gives a bit of a, a comparison between Aristotle and the Stoics. Uh, the Stoics, like Aristotle, strongly deny that there is, in, there is in human beings any innate or original evil. When they go wrong, it is on account of false belief, and this is why correct teaching can play such a valuable ethical role. And so just to, um, to state the obvious, perhaps, that's a contrast with the standard Christian view that in all Christians there's um, what's called original sin, which arises out of Adam's original error in Eden, which is transmitted to everybody else subsequently through normal conception. Uh, but that didn't that wasn't a thing for earlier belief systems such as um, the Aristotelians and the Stoics. So uh, Aristotle insists that social and ethical excellence is a purely human matter, and neither beasts nor gods have the ethical virtues. But for the Stoics, things are different. The universe is ruled by a virtuous God, whose self-sufficiency, the truly, truly virtuous life, attempts to emulate. Ethics is in the heavens as well as on earth, which is probably straight from Plato, I would say, from the Timaeus and the benevolent creator. Uh, and so this brings us back to this, this piece of the providential God lodged in us. Uh, so and that theme, that theme is really interesting. I, I know we've talked about it so many times. I, I need to read more about it, but I'm always struck by how that that stoic idea, this very stoic idea of the the microcosm in the microcosm, later gets so heavily used in like uh, medieval magic and stuff like that. That if we understood the the uh, sympathy between things here or within ourselves that we can then manipulate, we can also change events on a macroscopic um, level. It's that direct connection between us and it. It's really interesting how they thought to exploit that. Hmm. Sorry, I'm probably getting bogged down in the weeds a bit here, so I'll just try and move a little more quickly. So I'm on page 334 now. I was just going to say before you go on uh, the, that that she also wrote that it, it's not contingent. I, I It was just a quick little way of saying, you know, it wasn't, she's just that the stoic or, you know, view was that it was, it's not random, it, it, you know, yeah. Mm. Yeah, that's a, a good and point. And that investigating the depths of human nature is a sufficient way to reach the truly good. So we can get to it inside us. You could almost even um, overlook the fact that there's the, you know, that it's not more than just what's within each of us, you know. You could stop there almost with the Stoics, couldn't you? Just about. Just about. Okay, so given the starting points in the individual nature, the Stoics need to reach for the deepest and most indispensable moral intuitions. Uh, and so the pupil's attachment to reason is taken to include an attachment to logical consistency. And of course, the Stoics are very strong on logic. Uh, appearances often present cases of the pupil as widely different when on reflection, the differences will not stand up as morally salient. And this brings us to our political perspective. The Stoics frequently use this idea to criticize the differential treatment of human beings based on superficial distinctions of status, class, origin, gender, or wealth. Uh, they're, they're only superficial. What's critical is reason. And that's the, the um, distinguishing and shared feature of humans. Even uh, in Zeno's ideal city, for example, Men and women would, wouldn't be, even be distinguished by clothing. Uh, and uh, she mentions one of my favourites, Seneca Letter 47, where 
the imagined interlocutor, who may or may not be Lasalius. Um, actually, no, it's not Lasalius. She makes that point. It's it's some other imagined person who objects to sharing his life with his slaves. And Seneca mounts a really powerful argument that uh, essentially none of us are any different from slaves. We are, we are all slaves or we're all, you know, we've all had slaves in our ancestry. Why would anyone think they were any different from, from their own ser household servants? And so she reason, or sorry, Seneca reasons his way to that position. And that's what's important here. It's a reason position. Um, so, but on the other hand, a one-shot argument will not persuade the Kidian's husband or lover to give her a philosophical education any more than, than it will persuade the slaveholder of Seneca's letter 47 to perceive the natural equality between himself and his slaves. So there's a lot of resistance, obviously, uh, at a social level. Uh, and of course, that again is solely because of poor judgments or, or mistaken judgments. At the end of section, the section, uh, the second question there, she says, we get truth by toning up the muscles of the mind. So three, her third category of classification for these beliefs is responsiveness to the particular case. And that's, of course, key to the therapeutic practice. So it has to be, so, so the teacher has to be aware of what the particular stu of the student's particular situation is. Um, Cicero, as in the Epicurean text, mentions the notion of kairos, the critical moment, which applies to diseases of the body, uh, but also applies to diseases of the soul. And the other point is, and this is something from Seneca letter 40, um, it's something that, stay, that has to take place over time. All speech that is employed to cure the mind has to sink down into us. Remedies are no use unless they stay in the system. So Seneca is specifically using uh, the therapeutic metaphor there. Also, that thing about Kairos, I was really struck by that because I think that's really interesting. And this is the idea that if you think about it, it's really, really interesting because the medicine, the, the, the logo or whatever, can't just be written down. It can't just be like uh, a magic spell can't be like an argument just like that because it has to be delivered not only in the right way by an insightful person but at the right time mm. when there's a when there's a chink in the armor or whatever he knows or they know when to apply it and you see this sometimes when a really good therapist is is doing his thing like it's really clever. He'll just pick that moment and you'll just see the person just crack, you know? And and that's the kind of thing that I think is meant by that Kairos. And it takes into account, again, like I was saying, we often miss this temporality that's really pointed at in Stoicism, rather than it being more like the forms of Plato and the eternal world. There's this real being in the world and and finding the rhythm of the world and if you're sitting with somebody and they open up to you just at that moment they give you a, an opportunity to kind of to administer the, the poison or the medicine you know i think that's really interesting absolutely okay so um and then i really love this she you know does a deep, deep dive into seneca here uh, letter 64, I profoundly respect the discoveries of wisdom and their discoverers. It is the delight to approach, as it were, the legacy of many predecessors. That's a nice quote about Seneca thinking about his predecessors. Um, and so uh, then there's an extended medical analogy uh, about prescriptions for the cure of eye disease. Uh, so one particular mixture relieves irritation of the eyes, one reduces swelling of the lids, uh, and so on. Uh, the medic medicines for the soul were discovered by the ancients, but it is our job to find out how to apply them and when. Our predecessors accomplished a lot, but not everything. Uh, just a, again, another sidebar: the Romans were the Romans had really good eye medicine, <laughs> and that's been established by finding medical kits or you know a doctor's kits from the Roman world, and they've survived. And essentially. A lot of them are exactly the same as 
doctor's kits for treating eye problems today. So <laughs> this was um, a, a very pertinent um, a particular example. Uh, so the dignity of the doctor's work comes from the fact that however much has been done before him, what makes the difference between cure and disease is in his flexible hands. So what does this imply for philosophical teaching? Well, it's around um, a paradigm of philosophical interaction in the quiet conversation of friends who have an intimate knowledge of one another's character and situation. And this is what Seneca is doing in his letters to Lasanius. Uh, conversation is more useful than writing, even letter writing, because it creeps bit by bit into the soul. Uh, it's more effective than lectures because nobody, um, nobody's going to be influenced by being yelled at in a lecture theatre. Philosophy is practical advice and nobody gives advice when they're yelling. Uh, now, there's a reference here to Plato's Phaedrus. Now, in, in the Plato's Phaedrus, Socrates rejects the form of writing because he was worried about the impact it would have on people's memory that they entrusted everything to writing uh, and so he thought it, writing would always be an inferior form of communication but on the as she points out on the other hand there are good reasons for a stoic thinker to write and of course exactly that's what exactly what Seneca did he wrote his letters to Lasalius uh, it's important to try and reach as broad an audience as possible and so that's a justification for writing, therapeutic writing, as for as Seneca did. And also, that's one of the claims in um, Seller's book about the um, decline potentially of Stoicism was because of the success of Epictetus, who had a very negative attitude towards writing and reading books. That's the point Sellers makes in his book Stoicism. So yeah. Sometimes we don't want to, um, even if it might be right in principle, we don't want to discourage people from writing this stuff down. Otherwise, it might be lost, you know. Okay, so. Uh, Judy, there's, a, there's, a, there's a suggestion there too that, that it's possible that, that Lou Salis was, was a fictitious character. Is that, is that possible? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's um, a cert, there, there is a scholarly viewpoint that Lasalius didn't exist, but I, I think the majority of views that he did, but but certain certain scholars have taken the view that um, that Lasalius was just a, a figment of Seneca's imagination. Really, he was just writing these letters to himself. I th I, I believe there is no no independent evidence of the existence of Lasalius. There are no inscriptions, there are no other records. So it's possible Lasalius didn't exist, but I tend to think he probably did. In fact, I think there's, there's one particular um, text which might have been written by Lasalius. I'm trying to think what it is. I think it's something to do with volcanoes. And because Lasalius was based in Sicily, according to Seneca's letters, that's, that's why he's been associated with it. Yeah, I tend to think he existed. I, I, I don't think it was all, um, all made up. But, yeah, some people have, have alleged that. So I said in the chapter there was a few inconsistencies. Um, did it? Yeah. Like that, that's where this idea was coming from, that he was just made up. Uh, I think the idea that he was just made up came from the fact that there is no independent evidence for his existence, <laughs> um, which is kind of unusual because for most um, sort of Roman aristocrats, there's there's usually something else other than a, a particular literary work. There's something else to suggest they existed. And I don't think it's anything at all for Lasalius, but, yeah. I mean, that's a rabbit hole that, you know, perhaps we, we uh, don't need to, to go down. Uh, so where are we? Okay, so, so stoic teaching was highly individualised, but there's um, general principles. And um, first of all, it's to, to question fantasy, that's appearances, whether they've, been, uh, whether they've been acquired through the sense perceptions or sort of common beliefs. Uh, and it's more effective than a general statement to focus on the specific 
Now, Seneca's practice, uh, as she's saying at the end of page 338, is to move from concrete context to general reflection and back again, allowing each to illuminate one another. That's and very so interesting, isn't it? When you think about, like when I think about it, I think that's a really appropriate technique because how else do you get somebody to take on a philosophical idea um, that's a therapeutic idea. You have to create this contrast between their everyday concrete experiences and this normative kind of belief system that you're introducing them to. So you can imagine that you start out with concrete examples and they're like, oh, I got really angry because he's sleeping with that bitch. I know he's going to, maybe I should just murder my children. And then you've got to bring in the... Um, the larger principles, these more abstract ideas, zoom in and out, in and out, in and out. And, and at some point, it would hopefully, yeah, it would illuminate the problem because this was the point that she made around value relativity is that you'll start to see that your ideas are inconsistent with the truth, that you're being misled by belief, for example. Yeah. Well, I think that's what a, a good teacher does all the time is to, yes. is to um, oscillate between the uh, between well and another thing we use all the time is metaphor we use metaphors and analogies and illustrations um, to bring bring for, bring forward what's being indicated so yeah I think I think that's key to, to practice yeah oh, look even at, in my training uh, to be a maths teacher um, it was such a big part of it this whole this is such strong educative practice right here this idea of taking uh, going from the concrete to the theoretical, really important stuff. It's just, you know, basic uh, principles of education. Yeah. And yeah. So, um, I was just going to oh, say that it, the, it sounds really obvious, but this is exactly the thing is that people, common opinion, Ordinary opinion is so dogmatic that people often lose their ability to switch between their isolated view of things and other ways of seeing. And hence, that's that's the importance of doing it that way. But anyway, sorry. Okay. Yeah, 100%. And so um, halfway down page 339, she uh, gestures to the importance of exemplar and narrative and stoic teaching. And this is, so an exemplum, that's the singular. Exemplar is the plural. An exemplum is a is a sort of like a paradigm case, or, or an illustration from history, or an illustration from legend of what the point that you're trying to trying to indicate um, is made through. Uh, and it's important in you know all, all teachings we just said, but it's very important in Stoic teaching because, as she says, for their commitment to concreteness. For the Stoics, everything is corporeal. Everything is um, has has a substance in that in that sense, and so uh, a, a practical and a concrete illustration is key. And so, getting it right is not just a matter of a general content; it's a uh, a specifically katekon or acceptable or appropriate act. Uh, so, general content rules cannot guarantee a correct result. As Seneca says, they contain what a person ought to do, but not how. And that's the Latin word she quotes there, quem ad modem, what way it's to be done. That's from letter 95. What's needed is a ratio, a, a strategy of rational assessment that will in a concrete case show Nikidian when one ought to act and how far and with whom and how and why. Again, this is from letter 95, a procedure. Now the exemplar by themselves don't contain the procedure. They just kind of point you in the right direction. And, you know, this also points to a similar uh, comment that Long makes in his book, that Epictetus and the Stoic and Socratic way of life. He talks about those innate conceptions that we were talking about before, the preconceptions, that, that knowledge of the good. But he says because there's such general kind of ideas about the good, um, we can't necessarily we don't necessarily know how to line them up with concrete examples in the world and that's where we go wrong so we can have very general ideas or knowledges but we need to be able to articulate them very specifically 
according to ever-changing and ever-varied concrete situation. So this just reminds me, there's a book that came out in 2021, I think, by Jack Bishnick called The Invention of Duty, Stoicism as Deontology. And he and what he's tried to do in that book, among other things, very interesting and good book, is to reconstruct this ratio, this um, what you might call, uh, you know, like a, a thought process or a or a procedure for for um, establishing the correct action in a given situation. So his view is that such a thing must have existed. It's just that we've lost it, and so he's tried to reconstruct it. Uh, very what's interesting. His, what's thought. his name, Judy? What's his uh, name? Uh, Jack Vishnik. I'll, I'll um, I think. I'll just put it in the chat. And it's called The Invention of Duty. Mm -hmm. Stoicism was... as Deontology. All oh, right. Very um, interesting book. The, there's also this little um, bit there that about the exemplum that, that, that one of the techniques they used was to tell a vivid story, like a parallel story um, about a similar case sort of thing. Um, so that it wasn't personally triggering, <laughs> you know. Yeah, that's a really so, good point, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so these just strategies, these many strategies that they must have had in place, they must have had them. Yeah. Yeah, and and I mean, it wasn't specific to the Stoics. You know, uh, Roman um, education in general was replete with exemplar of virtuous people from the past doing virtuous things. In all kinds of different situations. So, and this is a case where Stoic um, principles are kind of like Roman principles hyperdeveloped. <laughs> uh, so the exemplar, as I say, were not specifically Stoic or not necessarily Stoic, that they were just part of a Roman education. And that's a very striking thing about um, the next reading for um, Saturday is um, on Providence by Seneca. It's just like exemplar after exemplar, isn't it? And, yeah, and exactly. That's right. And it's it really, really gets you stirred up because <laughs> he does it so well. <laughs> okay, so um, towards the end of page 340, um, she makes a really good point, I think, that the Stoic teacher is trying to um, arouse the student or the patient from sluggishness and carelessness of everyday life. And that's part of what this procedure is all around. Um, and she quotes again from letter 41 from Seneca that uh, with, which is a, a letter focusing on reason and in terms of divinity. He, Seneca talks about walking into a clearing um, and there's a, a grove and the feeling of um, a feeling of the numinous, the sacred in the, in the natural. Um, and the soul's challenge is to investigate these depths and to gain mastery over them. And we do this through practices of self-scrutiny. That's a really pretty metaphor. Wait, which letter is that in? Um, letter 41. It's a lovely one. Oh, I'll check it out. And so she closes that section by pointing out that the, these practices seem rather unremarkable today since we are the heirs of centuries of practices of self-confrontation and self-scrutiny from the confessional to modern psychoanalysis, which is kind of ironic when you think about it because right at the time she was writing this, Ado had also written about practices of the self and, and therapeutic techniques. So they're coming at it from two different directions, but essentially arriving at the same view, which is that um, these practices were key to, to self-transformation in both the Christian and the pagan traditions. Uh, and uh, it was left a, a dough to kind of identify that the Christians borrowed a great deal from, from, the, pagan, uh, from the pagan tradition. But I think Nussbaum's kind of reaching the same point in a sense. And so and there's a... And, a, a and oh, sorry, I was just thinking, Hadot's really responding to Foucault with, Foucault as well in that technology yeah, exactly. of the self because he thinks that he doesn't bring in the ethics enough and focuses too much on these technologies which can be used as um, methods of power or whatever. Yeah. So as she concludes this section, we see in Stoicism as in Epicureanism a vivid sense of the personal depth of good philosophical teaching. Uh, and uh, Seneca 
uh, speaks of doctoring and teaching and he's himself a teacher, but uh, he is teaching himself. And the secret of philosophic instruction is that the mind itself can bring itself before its own bar. Uh, that's that's a, a law court kind of metaphor. Autonomous, secret and free. And uh, she, and with the with the note there that not like the Epicureans, <laughs> you know, like as a as a contrast, quite a big contrast there in the nature of that. Yeah, um, that's right. Because the Epicurean one that she had identified was all around the confessional, essentially the the submission to the teacher who was the authority. But this is far more um, imputing to the student the the agency to do it themselves. Do you want to do the next one, Judy, Jody, sorry, or Ashley, or someone else? Ashley, did you want to? Um... No, nah, I'm at the gym. Oh, all right, okay. No, well, I can do five. That's fine. I can do that. I'll give you a break. Um, okay. So we are on page 341 in section five. So in this section, um, what is she doing? She's going now from the first three points, which are held in common with most of the Hellenistic schools, as she's pointed out in the other chapters. Um, and from here now in section five, she's going to go from points four to 10, which really point out many more of the differences. Um, so the Stoics, she said, side with, the, with Aristotle um, in, one, in the points one, two and three above. Um, with emphasis on, on social nature and the defence of intrinsic worth of practical reason and the symmetrical teacher-pupil relationship. So they were some things that were similar with the Aristotelians. But the Stoics interpret these features differently, which enables them to critique existing social institutions. So they have that slightly different uh, view politically than uh, Aristotle did. Um, Paul. Do you want do you want to remind us what that was? Well, I think it goes. I think she goes on to talk about it here in number four. Um, um, let me just see. I can come. We can come back to that. Um, let me just go on a bit further with four. But yeah, she she does talk a bit more about the the polis, his his attitude to um, virtue, uh, the idea of. Um, for how far reaching the Stoics were with the encompassing of the entire um, of, of all humanity, where um, Aristotle was probably more just, uh, he stopped at the polis. He didn't really go beyond that. I think I it also references the idea that um, early on in this book, she talked about common opinion and that she broadly called that a, a broadly Aristotelian view. And that was the idea that Aristotle more or less thought that there was wisdom in the ordinary practices of people. Uh, the contrast that she's talking about here, obviously, is that the Stoics are hypercritical of the common opinion, even down mm. to the point that we, you know, we routinely misuse appearances. Good point. Good. Okay, so for the Stoic arguments, um, it. it uh, okay, so point four is about does it seek the health of the individual? And she claims, yes, uh, the Stoic arguments do seek the health of the individual, but this also includes the pupil not forgetting, seeking the good for others. So that emphasis not just on the self, but on, on um, others. So the mission is to the whole human race. So Seneca in letter 48 uh, says, uh, we live in common. Um, you must live for another if you wish to live for yourself. So very strong quotes there. And then she goes on to uh, describe the, um, the concentric circles of concern that, uh, are discussed, uh, that are written about by Heracles in the first and second century, a Stoic in the first and second century. Um, so starting with self and body, she says, so soul and body in the middle, including the body. Uh, and soul in the middle and family then uh, in the next circle then remote family then neighbors then fellow city dwellers and then fellow countrymen and finally the whole human race 
and with the aim to draw those circles in towards the center. So to try to uh, establish relationship um, by bringing all those circles in closer and closer and establishing this deeper relationship as we can um, with all of those circles. Um, we aim to reduce the distance of the relationship with each person. He suggests changing the titles that we even address each other by and gave some examples uh, like auntie and mother and things like that, um, interchangeable uh, titles of endearment, things like that, um, which uh, was also possibly mentioned in Plato's Republic, she says. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I could tolerate calling one of my slaves brother. <laughs> so there is a point of difference then with um aristotle because he thought the unit here's that here's the point i was going to make he thought the basic unit was the polis with no moral obligation beyond that to humanity as a whole generally you know in, um the stoics have reverence for reason which includes reverence for the entire human species. And we are, I'm on page 343, and we are citizens of a, a worldwide community of rational beings. The political community in which we are placed is artificial in a sense, the political one is artificial um, and secondary to the fact that we are part of the whole, as Courtney brought up earlier. We are citizens of the world. This has been seen as a call to establishing of a world state. Some people have tried to interpret this as some sort of call for world government, but um, uh, but this was uh, taken from work by Plutarch, Plutarch, and who had read Zeno's Republic in his day, and had possibly interpreted it along those lines. But that's not necessarily. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be interpreted that way. It's unclear if Zeno uh, meant it politically or just that humans view themselves as linked and uh, and to seek the good of the whole species. On this so, note too, yeah. I, I, this is sort of more of a, I, I wonder what your opinion would be on this. Is I was thinking about, imagine if you were king of the world and you're really devoted, you know, you're really devoted to Stoicism, you're really devout Stoic. You'd think it would be great if I could convince other people to practice Stoicism because I really, as a Stoic, take very seriously that they are often misinformed in the use of reason and the most important thing is they practice how to learn reason correctly. But then I was thinking this just shows you how wise Marcus Aurelius was because he was the emperor. He could have probably tried to create some sort of educational regime or, or a change, you know, forcing it into the schools and that. But he never did, which I think is really interesting. Like, he obviously, I think the Stoics really go that far with their rational respect. It's It doesn't even force philosophy onto people. If they're not ready for it or they don't want to know about it, then that's perfectly okay. Do you think that's what motivated him? Yeah, so there's a really interesting. Uh, <laughs> so Marcus didn't like the um, the gladiatorial arena. I mean, it was the it was his role to go there and you know go along with it and turn up and but he obviously hated you know seeing humans and animals slaughtered for no reason, and and there was no secret about that. And in fact, people used people used to complain, <laughs> oh, he's going to try and turn us all into philosophers. <laughs> So literally what you're saying, Courtney, was yeah, people people just whinged about that. <laughs> he's a philosopher and he's going to change us into philosophers because he hates the, you know, the things that we like to do. So, yeah, I mean, he had that wisdom to know that um, the majority of people are not going to, the majority of people are just want to go, wanting to go along to the arena and see what they want to see and they're not going to want to be philosophers. He knew that and it was his great wisdom to not try and push that. But, but it didn't stop people from whinging about it, basically. <laughs> but that's so rare, that sort of wisdom. And also it makes you think, um, uh, I lost my train of thought, something about wisdom. And no, anyway, I'll come back to it. You can carry on. Yeah. Well, just butt in if you think of it. 
Um, yeah, so that just finishes that little section there that Nikidian will follow suit, that she will try to seek the good of all, regardless of the distance uh, um, of, of social class or, you know, race or gender or any of those things. Um, and that literary and historical texts will assist in the aiding of the imagination of this different way of life is how... Nuska I remember what it. I was going to say. Good. Just quickly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's something that comes up over and over again is in the more you read these sort of this ancient philosophy and specifically the kind of philosophy that thinks that it's doing the good work of really focusing in on what's most important, like the use of reason, that it's definitely the most important thing that we should be doing and that anybody should be doing. And that fosters a kind of elitism, right? And that's something that most people would easily get caught up in uh, especially in, and it poses a kind of potential threat to the stoic message itself which is that well even if it is right to do that you have no right to force that opinion on others or to some but but on the other hand how do then we do we put ourselves in a kind of educative role like, obviously, we're not forcing our opinions on others, but we still, to some degree, using persuasion and the, these causal forces that are in these um, these um, arguments. We've even been told that some of the Hellenistic philosophers thought that, that, um, that it only had to be persuasive. You know, it, it could be the instrumental use of reason to get people well rather than something to do with logic. Obviously, the Stoics are a bit different than that. But what do you think about that, that kind of conflict between, you know, the feeling that, and I guess religious people have this too, that what they're doing is right. It's not just a hobby. It's actually the most important thing they could be doing with their time versus the common opinion, which is, no, 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 you're full of shit. I'm not interested in that. Well, it's seen in a way as self, self-righteousness, self isn't it? And it's, that's a bit of a turn off anyway, isn't it? Like, um... Yeah, that's right. So Marcus, um, yeah, I, I think it's that ultimate wisdom to know that uh, you can't force wisdom on people, basically. <laughs> you know, wisdom is not something that's going to be um, imposed from above. It's something that's going to be uh, imparted by example, if if at all. Mm. And I'm sure, and I'm pretty sure that's the principle Marcus was working on. That if he if his example provided uh, a teaching model, well, well and good, but. But he wasn't going to explicitly go around and preach stoicism to people because that was obviously going to be counterproductive, and it was also it would also have been a distraction from what was his job, which was to to do the daily task in front of him. Yeah, it's an interesting temptation, isn't it? Like obviously, um, in the Middle Ages, the Inquisition. Um, kind of took it to a, a new level and said, let's just kill them all and let God sort out who the innocent ones are. It's kind of taken to another level, isn't Extreme. it? Extreme. All right, let's push yeah. on. I'll try, I'll try again. Yeah, that's the question. So, like, uh, still about, sorry about the back. The um, um, Aristotle is saying it's just about the polis. But is, is that sort of an excuse kind of thing there? Because He's, he's just studying what, what works. Like he's just kind of reporting um, as he sees it what makes people happy in new time. Whereas the Stoics are kind of giving them idealistic account of how to be happy. That, like, like, I'm not sure we can necessarily say, oh, it should only be stuck on the polis and not be just the polis. Your your uh, connection was a tiny bit jittery there, Ashley. So sorry to have missed a few words there. I think he was saying, if I picked it up, it was a bit blurry. But you sounded like you were saying something about um, you didn't do that. You didn't read it that way. Aristotle wasn't just focusing on the polis. Is that what you were saying? That he was interested in a kind of cosmopolitanism. Is that what you were saying? He's going to type it, 
So, uh, oh, it's just a little bit of background noise here. Yeah, just give me a I don't oh, guys, I need, to, I need to head off, but thanks for the discussions and I'll catch you next time. Oh, okay. Thanks, Ken. Yeah. Thank you. See you soon. Good to see you, Ken. Anyway, Ashley's you right? Are you typing, Ashley? Yeah. Shouldn't you be lifting weights? <laughs> You're building up the muscles in your um, phalanges. While he's typing, I'll just start building into five and seven. Um, practical reason has intrinsic value. So we're on page 344. Um, Stoicism constructs a symmetrical and anti-authoritarian uh, teacher-pupil relationship. So um, the central commitment is to the dignity of reason in each human being which shapes their teaching. Uh, like the Socratic idea of the unexamined life is not worth living, the Stoics wish to awaken the soul, causing it to take charge of its own activity, which is a, not really the aim of the sceptics and the Epicureans. Epictetus mocked the passivity of the needy pupil. He said, become yourself, both your own pupil and your own teacher. And Seneca in well, letter 33 encourages Lucilius towards independence and contrasts the Stoics to the Epicureans um, there are implications there for the great books. And there's a bit of a rave there about how, how uh, the idea of how to use books, the use of, of the great books. Um, and um, the thought of the three founders, Zeno, Cleanthes and Crispus are held important, but Epictetus and Seneca uh, define carefully how students should use these sources. So in Epictetus, we find a comparison of books to training weights, uh, so show me what you can do with your weights. We're on page 346. And he tells a student it's a bad, mis a bad mistake to think one has made progress by uh, internalising the contents. Um, where, and Seneca uh, compared also says in letter 33, uh, it is one thing to remember, another, another to know. And there is a danger of deference to authority um also when there is a need for distance and, a, and critical autonomy which is what they're aiming for all the way so in letter 88 Seneca uh, talks about liberal education this is page 347 philosophy is the only study whose activity is itself an exercise of human freedom um, food that helps the body is really a part of the body this is an interesting point um, so, you know, the, reflex, the reflexiveness of, of philosophy uh, that, you know, in the use of it, it's its, it's, a, it's its own reward. Philosophy is an art concerned with virtue and choice, intrinsically noble. If one is deluded into thinking reading books and learning uh, content are intrinsically important, one can become, it says, boring, wordy, <laughs> insensitive and self-satisfied <laughs> so be careful <laughs> i'm going to take notice of that even philosophy e.g metaphysical and linguistic analysis is not as valuable as the central social and ethical questions of human life so seneca and epictetus both ascribe great and positive value to the study of the great works of the major traditions um, you need the training weights to exercise um, we're on page 348 and Seneca here in letter 33 uh, com compares medical texts uh, to say a young doctor who, who should read them as a, and, and also as a whole, not just parts. It should be thoroughly read in its entirety, but books are seen as training for one's own independent thought. And so in letter 21, Seneca writes to Lucilius to use the parts he wants as the texts are public property. So that's a lovely license, isn't it, to um, interpret things in our own way and to, to do our own work, do our own study. Nikidian will also spend time in meditation and reflection. And Seneca in letter 15 says, exercise the soul both day and night. 
So this constancy this of, of attention. Um, how are we going? You're right, Ashley. Did you want to? No, you're still going. So six, val, um, value of logic. So this uh, this is another important part because the, their whole study of logic, excellent thought, is consistent, clear, precise, rooting out confusion, murkiness, and inconsistency. So logical virtues are an important part of the intrinsic worth of reason and have instrumental use. So Epictetus argues that a good person, we're on page 349, Epictetus argues that a good person should be able to test an argument and not be misled. So formal logical training is required. Um, it's disciplined mental gymnastics is what uh, is stated. It includes the meaning of terms, the study of syllogisms, which permits secure and confident arguing, puzzles and paradoxes. All of this comes before moral philosophy. So it's meant to come first. Logic is the measuring standard, but it is futile to pursue logical sophistication for its own sake without reference to the ethical content. Page 350 now, without reference to the ethical content, which is the whole point of logical training, isn't it? That's, that's what we're doing it for, um, to aid ethical thinking. So Seneca emphasises old age and shortness of time as a, re as a reason to not dwell too long reading everything. Um, and so attacks, log the, attacks the logical game playing, sorry, he's attacking, attacking the practice of logic for its own sake. Um, and he does this in letters 45, 48, 111, 117, uh, he sees logical and in linguistic inquiries having no practical benefit. They are games to serve the, the and uh, the, that serve to lighten our ills. Um, and the four points he makes, and and we'll cross over to page three hundred and fifty-one in the process. Four part the four points are: there's not enough time in our life. Um, that humans need help from practical help from philosophy. Uh, that the study is seductive, we can get trapped into getting stuck there, and 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 uh, it can weigh the mind down with technical questions. It goes on to say logic should serve one's practical choices. Um, the professional's love of cleverness for its own sake is to be avoided. Anything you want to say there, people? Because I'm up to number eight. Do you want me just to finish the section? Um, I will just um, yep. say, say in relation to um, that point about what Seneca's insisting on. Yeah. One thing that I've learned from reading his letters in depth is there's a character that he, he criticised again and again, and it's um, it's the the Latin word is levis, and and I translate that as a lightweight. So he's this is a person that he's always critiquing who's not serious, um, who's not committed to their own improvement. And, and so that's something that I think we can add to these four points she's bringing up about, you know, um, the lack of time, the, what we need from philosophy, uh, the um, seductiveness of, of uh, linguistic study and uh, the distraction involved. There's also the question of seriousness. You know, are we a serious person who's going to spend our time properly or are we just fooling around and, and being... Good point. All right. Um, okay, so I'll just finish eight and then nine and ten. Um, Nikidian will study, this is number eight, uh, she will study and critically evaluate writings from different traditions. So that's the point of eight, is to see how broadly they will study outside their own school. Um, so in letter uh, 45, Seneca says, I have not sold myself as a slave to anybody. I bear no master's name. I have much confidence in the judgment of great men, but I, can, but I claim nothing of my own judgment. But Oh, sorry, sorry. I have much confidence in the judgment of great men, but I claim something of my own judgment also. And again, that idea that truth is public property. And that is in letter 33. Uh, he says, truth lies open to all. It has not yet been appropriated. 
I love that. Um, Stoics have a high regard for poetry as having a valuable role, but vigilance must be redoubled. Um, so poetry was uh, scorned by Plato, as we know, in, and um, um, but the Stoics had room for it. They saw value in it. Um, Plutarch said on page 352, Plutarch said, let the young hear and read poetry, but watch over their judgment. The pupil can derive uh, from po the poetry whatever is of real worth, you know. So it is. it can be of value, reading poetry. Number nine and ten, I'll just quickly finish them. The arguments of Stoicism are cautiously optimistic about their own power. So this nine, points nine and ten are about, um, you know, what's their opinion of, of themselves as, as a... As a, as a thorough um, school. They, pr they promise some progress. The more one works, the better one will live and is linked also to the good of others. The Stoics refuse to trace human misery to any natural or inherent evil. And um, instead it is produced by ignorance, confusion, weakness of thought. Um, <clears throat> Reason can extricate the soul from any confusion society has produced. Isn't that lovely? The roots of false belief go deep in the soul, but Stoics are optimistic, based on deep, <coughs> based on deep belief that human beings are essentially reasonable and that reason is basically just and good. I thought that was quite an important little section in there on page 352 about... Um, the stand. Um, the arguments uh, Nikidian receives motivate her to pursue them further, both in her desire and her ability. And it ends with the statement: "Philosophy is health-giving and delightful." And that's in Seneca's letter number fifty. But again, it's not delightful to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> So quickly, seven, this is a short one. Um, and oh, six? It, You're up to six or seven? Six? Oh, sorry, six. I can't read. Yep. Can't read Roman numerals. My bad. Six. Okay. So uh, just quickly, um, Nikidian um, is sort of reflecting on the differences between Stoicism and the other schools in the first paragraph. So um, here she finds a way of life ordered by reasoning, in contrast to the life offered by popular religion, um, this will be a life committed to argument, whose God is the God within. In contrast to the life of scepticism, this life will be active, vigilant, critical, committed to truth. In contrast to the life of Epicureanism, this life is suspicious of any external authority, reverential only to reasoning itself. It is egalitarian and universalist about reason, and it commits itself to the fostering of rationality in the self and in the whole of, of in the whole, sorry, in the world as a whole. And he bring she brings up this, yeah, what I was talking about before. I uh, forgot that she was so keyed into Foucault's work here, where he mentioned um, in that techniques of the self. As, that stoicism was a set of techniques for the formation and shaping of the self. And I've, I've always found that to be a really fascinating argument. I'm glad I kind of came across it fairly early on because obviously that's what psychology is. So that's quite an interesting perspective that we can, how is it human beings can find ways in which they can operate as causes on themselves, they can shape themselves and not have to be just passive beings in a world that otherwise shapes them. That really interests me. That's a super interesting thing. So what sets philosophy apart from popular religion, dream interpretation, and astrology is its commitment to rational argument. What sets Stoicism apart from other forms of philosophical therapy is as its very particular commitment to the pupil's own active exercise of argument. Um one does not do this by anything but good argument, she says. We we have not images of habituation and constraints so prominent in Foucault's writings. 
Uh, this is a little disagreement she's having here, but an image of incredible freedom and lightness, the freedom that comes of understanding that one's own capabilities and not social status or fortune or rumor or accident are in charge of what is most important. Um, so it models a, a kingdom of free beings, she says, which is the ancestor in terms of both content and causal influence of Kant's kingdom of ends, a kingdom of beings who are bound to one another, not by external links of hierarchy and convention, but by the most profound respect and self-respect, and by their sense of the fundamental commonness in their ends. Um, so that's about it. Uh, who wants to do seven? Oh, well, I can push on with seven. One of, it's all about Seneca, so that's good for me, like that. Okay, so Seneca's practice. Uh, she wants to focus in on some of his letters. Uh, so letter 44, uh, she says, is a rather ordinary letter, uh, one of many that Seneca addresses to Lasalles on the subject of status and related external goods. And so there's a discussion around what is appropriate uh, for someone of his family and his social rank. And here we find out that um, Lasalius is uh, based in Sicily. He's, he's got an important role there. Uh, he's, uh, he's making good progress, but and he's pursuing some philosophy. There aren't many books, so he's asking for Seneca to send him some books. But people have been talking about him. <laughs> he's been the subject of gossip and envy. Despite his newfound fame, or perhaps because of it, Lusalius is anxious and has little self-esteem. Contemnas ipsete, you, you despise yourself, says Seneca. And so here's Seneca imagining Lusalius in his daily life. Uh, and it's about what, Seneca, or what Lusalius thinks of his, own, um, of his own position, of his own importance and of his own significance, I guess, as a human being. And Seneca finds himself urging Lasalius to, to respect himself more, really. Uh, and it's not to do with uh, ancestry, because as we mentioned before, this is part of the Stoic worldview. Everybody has slaves and everybody has kings and nobles in their ancestry. We're all in that same boat, you know, that's neither here nor there. But ultimately, everybody descends from the divine, from the gods. So we all have divine ancestry. Um, there's everybody's, you know, there are all these gradations in, in civilian life. Um, you know, uh, Seneca's, uh, sorry, Lasalus is part of the order of the knights, the equestrian order, but then there's the Senate and then there's the army. But as Seneca points out, a good mind, bona mens, is open to all. In respect of this, we are all nobles. Philosophy neither rejects nor selects anyone. Its light shines for all. And as she points out, then we have a counter society set over against Roman society. Uh, pointing out that, you know, Lasilas's uh, concerns about rank are neither here nor there. Uh, and then she, uh, so Seneca gives the examples. And I remember when reading this letter thinking where Seneca says Plato was no noble but was made noble by philosophy. Well, actually, that's not correct. Plato was a member of an aristocratic Athenian family, and, and Seneca must have known that. But he's, he's just underlining that, his true, that Plato's true nobility was because of what he achieved in his life with philosophy. And we've all got the potential to follow these great uh, people from the past, and, and the, particularly these great uh, thinkers and philosophers of the past. We can all essentially take them as our predecessors. Uh, and so then Seneca brings in the idea about freedom. Um, and this is kind of key to Roman uh, self-image. So there was this, so freedmen in Roman society were people who had been slaves, but because of their uh, decision by their master or mistress, they had been, they were freed and they were made uh, non-slaves. They were now free people. Um, and so Seneca plays on this idea about freedom. You know, who's really free in our society? Is it somebody who was formerly a slave or is it somebody who was given over to uh, passions or obsessions or addictions? And that's the whole idea around freedom. Um, so there's a, a conflict about 
uh, beliefs in in the society's own being people get mixed up with their people get entangled with their uh, the impediments of life and how do we really be free and the only way that we can really be free is by following reason and attending to its guidance with care uh, in finding our way through the tangled maze of a human life. And uh, it's something that the Silius can do and is recommended to do with a careful choice of language and imagery. And so Seneca is participating with him in this process in the shaping of their souls. So that takes us to the end of section seven on page 357. And a quick uh, finish off of the chapter. I've got it just highlighted in, unless Jody's got a short a short one, I've just highlighted a few sections. Okay, she's pointing at me. So, okay, so oh, this is eight, sorry. Yes, I can't read today. By focusing on procedure rather than on all of the content of Stoic philosophy, Nussbaum, obviously introduced one large and central part of that content, the emphasis on the dignity of reason. So that's been the focus. But one could, it seems, approve of what has been said here about the importance of freedom and self-formation, about the equal dignity of all human beings, about books and self-reliance, about the moral irrelevance of gender, class and status without being a Stoic. And here's that point about the value of relativity. For the Stoics, as we shall see in the following chapter, hold that ties to items outside oneself are without intrinsic value, and it does not seem to be incumbent on the believer in rational self-determination to believe this. <clears throat> it reminds me just quickly of an exercise. I'm a member of a men's group, and we do these little psychological processes just to get the men thinking about different things. And it was my turn and I may have already mentioned this to you guys, but I think it's kind of humorous. I told them to bring a favoured small item um, to show to the group. And then they, they're they all very excited to bring in their little trinkets. One guy had a little travelling um, painting kit and someone had a photo of a loved one and so on. But I wrote these um, like a, a, a prompt on a card that they weren't allowed to read yet and they handed it to the partner they were standing across from and the card said, please take this item from me and throw it in the trash because I value it too highly. And I was just playing on this idea about how we invest so much in these external things. Of course, you know, I let them off the hook at the end, but but we were really, <laughs> they were interested in exploring the, the feelings that came up for them afterwards. So, so it became an interesting kind of experience. But the point being, even they were able to reflect on the fact that, well, it's just a thing that, that can be lost or broken or taken away. And uh, it's strange that I hold it in such high regard, you know, for example. Hey, you asked them to bring along this item and then you um, <laughs> urged the partner to throw it in the... <laughs> <laughs> I think you... <laughs> I hope you're not... Um cleaving to the uh, inglorious tradition of um, psychological experimentation by by exploitation, Courtney. <laughs> You're the last person I would have thought to have, you know, gone to this uh, kind of expedient. Oh, well, you know, at the end it was like, no, no, I'm just joking. Yeah, have, have your stuff back. I'll, I'll, I'll get it out of the bin for you. It didn't end up in the bin. But no, you get the point. Yes, I couldn't help it. I, I sometimes am a very cruel person. That's true. Okay. Um, indeed, one could imagine a further unpacking of the notion of practical rationality itself that would allow emotions such as love, sympathy, and grief to play a guiding role. There you go. See, I, I didn't, I didn't internalize that message. Obviously, to some extent, these commitments really are independent of one another. One may continue to pursue many of the Stoic goals investigated in this chapter, under some description at least, without accepting the anti-passion side of Stoicism that I shall describe in the following chapter. So that's an interesting point. Um, and I think it's one modern Stoics try to, to work out some solution to sometimes, right? How to take the practical and obvious benefits without going the whole hog, so to speak, with the passions. 
She, she then says there is still need for caution for the stoic argument will, cha will charge that the life of the person in question is actually inconsistent. Many people they charge claim that they are committed to their own integrity and practical reason while living lives of subservience to passion that conflict with and undercut that commitment. In other words, they claim, whether successfully or not, that the commitment to rational self-determination, properly understood, actually entails the extirpation of the passions. So again, if you don't go the whole hog, then um, then you're living an inconsistent life rationally. Um, so in closing, really, um, what she got here in this way: reason's zealous hegemony. Plausible and attractive though it is, points beyond itself to, to some of the more disturbing and controversial elements in Stoicism. Can one live in reason's kingdom understood in the way the Stoics understand it and still be a creature of wonder, grief and love? And that's an interesting point that um, people like to argue about. And surprise and spontaneity she also puts in there, a bit further back up the page. Mm -hmm. um, she did a bit of this at the end of the section on Epicureans, didn't she? Sort of that questioning of the removal of emotion. She sort of brings yeah. it back to, she's brought it back to that a few times. So And, and the sceptics, I think. Yeah, so she'll be sort of obviously bringing us to this finale, isn't she? It's like a deliberate move, I think. I, um, I haven't read the rest of the book, see? <laughs> you, you guys have. You yeah, know and, and it's. And it's this question of shaping, you know, if we go mm. out and shape ourselves and we take this kind of agency to do so and operate us our, on ourselves with these medical tools, if you like, will it improve our life or will it denude our life and impoverish it in some way? And, and at what cost? Like if we are really going to tear out passion by the roots, is that really appropriate? That's what that's what I'm sort of seeing as the big finish, you know, the big ending. I I, I want to see how she how she sort of finishes on that, you know. What did what what is her what is her position at the end of it all? But anyway, we'll get there. We'll get to that. <laughs> um, I just want to uh, quickly look at Ashley's point that he's put in the chat. I'm not sure Aristotle would think we should not have humanity as a whole in mind and only exclusively exclusively focus on the polis. His method was just to report what he has seen working, whereas, oh, hang on. Uh, cosmopolitanism is somewhat idealistic. Nussbaum is saying he wouldn't agree with it. I'm not convinced. I think it just probably wasn't on his radar for his time. Mm. Um, yeah, look, yeah, that's, uh, that's a whole kind of, I think, debate in the history <clears throat> of political science, if you like. And, and kind of because um, there's a school of thought that thinks that stoic cosmopolitanism somehow or other is, arises out of um, the Alexander experience, uh, you know, going to the East and setting up all these new kingdoms and how everyone's going to be part of the, the kind of the, um, the Greek cosmopolis, really, the, the Hellenismos, really. That's what Hellenistic means. It was this export of Hellenistic ideas to to an entire world. Um, and so whether it was on Aristotle's radar or not, I mean, Aristotle was there and he witnessed what Alexander was doing. So <laughs> yeah, who knows whether it was on his radar or not. Um, I, I'm not enough of a, I don't know enough about um, Aristotle's political theory to, to have a view on that. So, yeah, I'm not sure, actually. Interesting question, though. All right. Awesome. Well, I think it's time to pack up, but do you have any closing statements? Um, I was just going to say I read quickly um, Seller's review of Christopher Gill's book this afternoon, and um, I uh, obviously Christopher Gill uh, sees that the, the whole of uh, Stoic ethics can, can be, according to John Sellers, uh, that Gill sees it as not resting in the physics. So it was just interesting to see that. Yeah. And this, like what we've just done tonight, 
was seeing ethics nested very much in the physics. Anyway. Yeah, I think it's an interesting argument. I mean, I take a fairly traditional view on this. I I think I think people have learnt to treat the ups and downs of life, the excessive emotionality of life, the common opinion that that sort of life is is worth living. They tend to guard it um, very, um, and 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 they're defensive of it. And they think that anything else, like a tranquil life or less, well, is basically set up in in the idiom, if you like, as a, a kind of a, um, uneventful life, a kind of boring life, um, and and I don't know. I think the more you practice with this way of thinking, I mean, obviously, I'm no sage, but. The more things settle down and you enjoy a kind of routine and you kind of get into the discipline of it, life takes on a different kind of satisfaction. It's it, it's simpler and it's um but there's a great joy in having more agency in, in in a very deeply existential way. And it's something I talk about with addicts, for example, in counseling. Like I they don't talk about it because they don't really know really what I'm getting at half the time. But I'm really interested in the phenomenon of, because I've experienced it in the past, of what it's like to lose your agency and, and how crippling that feels to become aware of the fact that you you are just, you have no control over yourself. It's fucked. It's like literally the worst thing. But in a way, the stoic argument is that people who live without guarding reason are more or less not living um, in control of themselves and so we've already compromised at that existential kind of level the most important thing to us that defines us that will make us who we could be and and yeah i mean so yeah i'm i'm pretty much on board but i know not everybody will agree and they'll throw in counter arguments Anyway, that's my two cents. All right. Well, um, thanks, everyone, tonight. It's been a very good discussion. Yeah, thank you. Good night, everyone. Yep. Thanks, Gordon. Anything to offer, Lee? Oh, it's just very intriguing to be part of it. Be part of it. You know, I kind of thought um, just the whole, the whole premise of, you know, kind of how it begins in terms of... Um, uh, you know that 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 therapeutic lens and being able to um, uh, use that stoic perspective to master the soul or to to improve the soul. There's there's, there's often that notion of the removal of emotion. Um, yet there's there's almost a sense of when when one has control or when one is logical, it kind of induces its own kind of emotional response as well and there's like a moderate it's like a it's more like the moderation of emotion because there's there's that sense of when you're when when, when you have that control or when you have you, you're in that rational space that that in itself feels good because that in itself um aligns with i guess that sense of agency that you were saying where you can where you can be more clear in in what those virtues look like and how you should respond, which is just an interesting contrast. Are you inspired to read the book now? <laughs> uh, I'll, it's uh, worth a read. I'm, I'm just, it's good to just get back into it a little bit, you know? <laughs> well, more stoicism in a fortnight, so... Good night, everybody. Wonderful to see you again. Yeah. Take care. <laughs> see ya.